At first of all, the train from Narrabri to Sydney, when it's on time, usually arrives in Sydney at the beginning of, I would have said, peak hour. In Narrabri, I've noticed two peak hours. They last for five minutes. <laughs> One around five and the other at 5.30. But in Sydney, they have peak hours. And so you get off the train from Narrabri and you join a train that's packed with people. Now, travelling by the suburban trains towards the west, that's where Parramatta and the Blue Mountains are, or southwest, and that's heading southwest, when we go, we see an amazing variety of passengers. Most of them, on reflection, are migrants or first or second generation descendants from migrants. And they come from many different countries. The last census shows us that they follow a variety of spiritual beliefs and that a big proportion of them have no spiritual belief at all. Very few of those commuters would have a saving faith in Jesus. As the train goes along, if you look out the window, you see a whole string of churches, some of them with names out the front that you can't read because they're in uh, languages that I can't read anyway. And we see mosques, we even see a synagogue, at least one. We see some um, Buddhist places of worship and a few others that I'm not sure what they are. But it's important that we know if we're one of the majority heading for eternal condemnation. Corinth, and that's the people that Paul wrote his letter to, Corinth also had a cosmopolitan population. The church that Paul had planted there had believers with diverse backgrounds, but they had a common faith in Jesus. They had accepted the gospel that the apostle Paul had preached to them. They knew the words of Jesus recorded in John's biography of Jesus that God loved the world in this way, he gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. Later in that passage, Jesus also says, but anyone who does not believe is already condemned because he has not believed in the name of the one and only son of God. Now, that's important. I used to think that I was a bit of a mugwump when I was a, an early sort of a teenager, one of those people that sits on a fence with their mug on one side and their wump on the other. And I believed in Jesus, but I also wanted to do the things of the world and I um, had lots of yeah, attractions there. But... John tells us that there is no group of undecided. He said you're either condemned or you have faith in Jesus. There are not, there's no group that are still to determine. The people that are still to determine are the people that don't believe in Jesus. Now some of them have no intention of ever believing in Jesus. Some of them are thinking about it, but they haven't believed yet. So you're either one or the other, but you can't be in between. So that answers the first question on the sermon notes. Who will have eternal life and who will not? So let's turn to page 1025 in the Church Bibles to find 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and the reading starts at verse 11. 
And so Paul says to the Corinthians, Therefore, since we know the fear of the Lord, we try to persuade people. What we are is plain to God, and I hope it is also plain to your consciences. We are not commending ourselves to you again, but giving you an opportunity to be proud of us so that you may have a reply for those who take pride in outward appearance rather than in the heart. For if we are out of our mind, it is for God. If we are in our right mind, it is for you. For the love of Christ compels us since we have reached this conclusion. If one died for all, then all died. And he died for all so that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for the one who died for them and was raised. From now on then, we do not know anyone from a worldly perspective. Even if we have known Christ from a worldly perspective, yet now we no longer know him in this way. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away and see the new has come. Everything is from God, who has reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and he has committed the message of reconciliation to us. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, since God is making his appeal through us. We plead on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. He made the one who did not know sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So why does Paul seek to persuade people? Well, our reading begins with two words, knowing then. This tells us that the previous sentences are important to our understanding of what Paul is about to say. Chapter 5 commences with Paul looking forward to eternal life after his time in his present mortal body. When that comes to an end... He's looking forward to eternal life. In verse 10 of chapter 5, Paul reminds his readers that we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each may be repaid for what they have done in their mortal body, whether good or evil. Now, it's important to know whether you're headed for eternal life or not. The judgment that Paul is talking about now is the judgment on how you have performed since you came to put your trust in Jesus. So that second judgment, if you like to call it that, only applies for people who have their faith in Jesus because the others are already condemned. Paul, knowing this, that he's going to have to come before Jesus and be judged, Paul works to persuade non-believers to put their faith in Jesus and therefore no longer be condemned for eternity. Now, he knows that the Lord God is all-powerful and is able to deal with any opposition, and the Lord has commissioned Paul to take the gospel to the people outside the land of Israel. Paul has a healthy respect for God. That's the fear that Paul has. He respects God for who he is. He respects God for the power that he has. And that's that fear. So that encourages him to go ahead with his work of persuading non-believers. Now, 
How does the world value people? Well, the worldly observer does not appreciate that Paul is seeking to change the hearts of people. Paul doesn't set out to appear successful as a well-dressed, um, prosperous preacher for God or anything like that. Now, there were people that had come to the Corinthian church who may have filled that sort of description and they didn't agree totally with Paul. They were trying to teach other things. Paul does not preach a prosperity gospel. Believers in Jesus are still exposed to the things that they were before. They're exposed to cancer, to catching COVID, to suffering in floods, in droughts, and they may even be have all their wealth, if you like, destroyed in bushfires. Now, for those who judge by external appearances, Paul may appear to be great, or more likely, the worldly people may judge him to be a loser, a failure in the battle to succeed in life. He may even appear to be out of his mind. Now, what Paul was saying there was if the people think that he is in his mind, well, that means that they look upon the Christians in Corinth as listening to somebody who's worth listening to. But generally, they looked at Paul and they saw a guy who didn't look as smart and flash as the other people because the world judges on outward appearances. And when you have a look at TV, you'll see that with all the ads. If you're one of those people that watch influencers, you'll see that these people are trying to show you how you can look better, last better, attract other people, get richer, all those sorts of worldly things but they're not things in the heart. And God looks into the human heart. He knows what we are thinking. He knows if we hate some people. He knows if we are jealous of others. He knows if we do or do not forgive people who hurt us in any way. God knows whether or not we believe that Jesus really is God's only son. We can't trick God because God sees into our hearts, he sees into our minds, and he knows just where we stand before him. How did reconciliation start? Well, God loves all people and he grieves because the people that he created do not want to seek his approval their backs are turned to God. Now, that's the normal state of humans. We like to run things our way. We like to leave God out of it. What God said to the Old Testament in the Old Testament was that the people that he had made big promises to had turned away from him to the gods of the nations around about. And he put that in a, a worldly sort of setting where he said it's just like a husband having a wife and the wife has deserted the husband and gone off with somebody else and committed adultery, just gone and forgotten him, left him. And that's very, very hurtful to the person who got dumped and that's the way that God looks at things. He's hurt by the fact that people don't appreciate him. Now, God's greatest command, as Jesus said, is to love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. Now, if you don't know God and you're not prepared to go his way, you certainly aren't keeping that commandment. 
So even while we were still seeking to run our own lives and disobey God, he showed his love for us in sending his son, Jesus, to be the propitiation for our sins. He sent his one and only son who had done nothing wrong. He sent him to die on the cross as a cursed criminal. He sent him to pay the punishment that each person deserves to suffer. But Jesus has paid it for us. So Jesus became the bearer of our sins so that we could justly be judged as being righteous in God's eyes. Because if we don't have the sins visible to God, God sees us as righteous. And because we dumped the sins, or God dumped our sins on Jesus, we appear righteous and then we can be reconciled to God. We can be at one with God. To show that God had accepted Jesus' death as the one true sacrifice, sufficient for the sins of all people, God raised Jesus on the third day, the day we celebrate as Easter Day. So if you look again at verse 17 in 2 Corinthians, Chapter 5. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, and see, the new has come. Now, that's very important to understand. Because... When we turn to Christ, we turn away from the things of the world. Now, the second reading that we had, the one from um, 1 John, it was about the things of the world that are going to pass away, the nasty things that we used to like. But if we put our trust in Jesus, we become new people. And because we've become new people, uh, Bernard used to say that we've gone into a new postcode. And so we belong to another kingdom. Now, what does an ambassador do? Well, an ambassador's, well, they've been in the news quite a bit lately, really because the ambassador from Russia tells the Australian government, uh, look, you really haven't read the reasons that we wrote down and publicised for needing to go into the Ukraine. Because if you had read the reasons, you would understand that what we're doing is something that pleases God. Now, I was reminded of that, I suppose, during the week when I saw that the Russians had built a new bridge across a river so that they could get into a particular spot in the Ukraine. And that new bridge was being blessed by a minister from the Russian Orthodox Church. He was going along sprinkling holy water on the bridge to make it, I suppose, you know, God's way of the Russians getting from Russia into the Ukraine. They believe that they've got God on their side. And, of course, the other thing is that the ambassador is the one that gets the messages from Australia where we keep telling the ambassador, hang on, hang on, you're doing the wrong thing. And so he then relays that back to Russia because the ambassador is the representative of the foreign country and he speaks to Australians on behalf of that foreign government. We see the same sort of thing. We've got a new ambassador from China and 
to sort of paraphrase what he said, he said, look, we'd like to get things going the right way. We like to trade with Australia. We like Australia to appreciate the nice things in China. But we think that you've got things a bit wrong because you're trying to make comments about the way we run our internal affairs and the way that we run our foreign affairs. Now, if you just keep quiet and keep your nose out of the way we run our country and we run our foreign affairs, then we can be good friends. Now, Australia has told... I don't know whether they've actually told the ambassador yet, but they're thinking about it, I suppose. You could put it that way. Now, Paul was an ambassador for Christ because he was trying to persuade people who didn't know Jesus, people who are still living in the old postcode, he was trying to persuade them to put their trust in Jesus. Now, believers are reborn as citizens of heaven rather than citizens of the broken world. As believers, we act as ambassadors for Christ, passing on God's plea for the unbelievers to be reconciled with God. God has made Jesus take the sins of the unbelievers upon himself so that they can become righteous and be born again into a new life with Jesus as their ruler. They die to their former ruler, the devil. Now, It's great to know about ambassadors and what Paul did and stuff like that, but can each of us be an ambassador? Well, as an ambassador for Christ, and we really are whether we like it or not, it's up to each of of us believers to show the world around us that our new postcode is the best place to be. You have great joy in knowing Jesus as a brother because you've been adopted as a child of God if you're a believer. You convey to unbelievers the joy that you have in knowing that there is a good place prepared for you after you leave this present mortal existence. It's a core promise from God and God keeps his promises. If people continue to ignore God, then God has promised that your future will be eternal condemnation. There's only two ways. Now, we're not all good preachers, teachers or pastors like Paul was. God has blessed us with different gifts and skills so that we can put those to good use as witnesses for God. As we are commanded to love our neighbours as we love ourselves, it's only fitting that we show the love of God to the people that we meet. So we can pray for the unbelievers around us, support them in every possible way as we encourage them to look to Jesus as their Saviour and Lord. None of us can do this in our own strength because if we try that, we're going to crash. But the Holy Spirit is just waiting for us to ask for his assistance so that he can work through us in the spreading of God's love in this world. So let's close now with this prayer. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that the Apostle Paul preached to people in many places in obedience to your command. We thank you that through successive generations, others have passed the good news on, even to the extent of passing it to Australians who live on the opposite side of the world to Corinth. So please take us and through the guidance of your Holy Spirit, make us effective ambassadors for your kingdom. May we seek to persuade others to accept your free gift of reconciliation through the saving work of Jesus. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Saviour. Amen.